This is The Fire These Times, and I'm your host, Joey Ayub. In this third season, we will be exploring internationalist solidarity, prefigurative politics, solar punk, and how to tackle some of the most pressing challenges of our times. Each episode will be on one or more of these topics. But before getting into today's topic, I wanted to quickly tell you that you can support this podcast for as little as two or five dollars a month on patreon.com slash fire these times. That is patreon.com slash fire these times. If you cannot donate, you can still support by sharing it with your friends and families and leaving a review wherever you listen to podcasts. This helps it get more exposure and introduce it to more folks. That's it for me today. I hope you enjoyed this episode. Okay, uh, so if it's okay with you, can you start with just like introducing yourself, uh, name, pronouns, what you do, where you come from, that sort of thing, whatever you want to share? Yeah, for sure. Uh, my name is Andre. Um, I go by Hydroponic Trash online, both on Twitter and TikTok. Um, I'm a hacker, a gardener. Um, I do a lot of just random stuff here and there. Um, I write speculative solar punk fiction um and i do a lot of diy articles on substack where i um release like long form articles either about solar punk or um just about building things in general so i feel like folks have who have been listening to this podcast for some time probably know already what solar punk is but i i do like to have different folks try and define it because i always get a different answer although they're all kind of obviously linked but the way people frame it can be quite interesting in different ways so how would how would you define it um i just find solar punk to be both like a speculative fiction genre i mean that's kind of what it kind of started out as Mm -hmm. but to me i kind of see it as kind of a new way of conceptualizing science fiction and kind of like a framework to work off of, of thinking about different types of futures. Um, I think we get caught up a lot of times in dystopic futures are kind of the norm for most people. Um, but having any kind of hope for the future, I think it's really interesting. So um, I think solar punk differentiates itself a lot from other, both like fiction genres and just like other forms of imagining futures, just in the way that like, it combines um, social change with technology and the ecology Um, because Mm -hmm. a lot of different frameworks away about thinking about, you know, the future is we should return back to the past of like some time that existed in the past. But um, I really like solar pump because it's looking more towards the future, Um, really trying to imagine, you know, the changes that we can make that aren't reliant on, you know, getting rid of technology, but also is questioning, like, where does our technology come from? How do we use technology in appropriate ways? Um, What are some ways that, like, we can go into a better future without also extracting the planet, but also exploiting other people? And so I think that's, like, directly tied into kind of, like, the solar solar punk ethos or, like, the punk aspect of it a lot. As, as well that's kind of intertwined with um kind of the social change that's behind all of it yeah thanks and so i i asked you to come on because i read this super long essay that you've written on your Substack, which i will obviously link in the show notes as i often do and the Substack, by the way is called anarchosolopunk.substack.com right yeah that one uh, so people should definitely check that out. So okay, that so the title of that um, piece, essay, article, whatever is "Solar Punk, Acid Communism, Capitalist Co-opting, and Learning from the Counterculture." Uh, it's super long, as I said. So probably you, you, it would take too long to explain all of it. So, that, so we won't do that. But can you kind of walk us through some of the general points and kind of what motivated you to write that one? Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, it's definitely kind of a combination of different. Um, ideas and topics that I've been kind of thinking over for a really long time and all of it kind of started to click. So I just said, you know what, let me combine all of them. Cause I started to see kind of like a Venga diagram 
where you have separate topics that seem really distant, but yeah. when you kind of think of them, they start to combine these really weird ways. Um, so I'll just do like a, ha- a high level overview um, <laughs> and, we could, and we could touch over some of the points that like all connect together. So um, in the article, I kind of talk about the past um, and more specifically like the counterculture of the 1960s and the 1970s. Um, both from the angle of like the radical political change that was happening at the time um, and the cultural change that was happening with civil rights and the psychedelic movement kind of kicking off uh, at the time and combining in in some pretty cool, cool aspects. Um, I kind of find it pretty often that when people talk about like the counterculture of the time, um, they tend to paint it as like everybody in the counterculture was like white middle-class stoners like doing lsd in san francisco and like the stereotypical idea of like hippie dropouts and stuff like that um but i wanted to point out in the article that like the importance that marginalized people played um in the core of the early counterculture um and they were at the core at producing the social and cultural and political change that kind of happened out of that um so the topic of the counterculture was brought up from a piece by Mark Fisher that he was working on called acid communism. Um, And in that piece, he kind of both like criticized and praised the counterculture of the sixties for a really long time. He had been really critical of the counterculture um, through a lot of his works through a lot of his lectures through a lot of like, you know, talking to other people. And then all of a sudden it felt like he had like this change of heart when it came to the counterculture. Um, And so from that paper or from that work, he was talking about some of the failures, but also some of like the potentials out of this idea of acid communism. Um, And so while he was working on that, um, he was also doing a lecture series called Post-Capitalist Desire, which I think we could both agree that sounds way better than acid communism for a whole bunch of reasons. Definitely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. (laughs) Um, We can get into that because, yeah, there's a lot of of stuff to unpack in just those two words of acid communism versus Mm -hmm. post-capitalist desire. Um, But in this work, he described a libidinal Marxism, like a new form of leftist organizing and politics um, that, you know, took and learned from the failures of the 60s counterculture um, and progressed past it. Mm -hmm. Um, So he was describing new forms of organizing and conceptualizing about the world in a way that wasn't like hauntological and didn't rely on old, um, you know, views of the past. Um, And so while I was listening to an audio book of of, of the post-capitalist desire um, lectures, hearing his dis- descriptions of kind of new ways of imagining a future that involved uh, social change and cultural change, um, solar punk really kept coming up in my mind because at the time too, I was really getting into the ideas behind solar punk and starting to write fiction and starting to write um, articles and stuff like that about solar punk. And so it was kind of one of those things where all the, all, all these three things were starting to combine together. And so in the article, I really wanted to show like the connections between what I see of like a, a type of acid communism that solar punk envisions um, while also imagining a new form of a counterculture, but also learning from the pitfalls that we saw from the counterculture and actually seeing some of the um, the same issues from the counterculture pop up even now. So it's kind of a cyclical process of like looking back at the past, but also looking at the future and trying to figure out new ways of thinking of this stuff. Yeah, I I went through Mark Fisher's work in the past few months, actually. I was kind of vaguely familiar with him before. Um, unfortunately, I was in London when, when he died by suicide. So I remember this being in the news. Uh, so I had so I was familiar with Capitalist Realism, which I guess is his most famous work. So I read that one about a couple of months ago. And then I read the second one, which I think is called Ghost of My Life. And that one is the one that really, really clicked with me. Even more, I mean, the first one is really good as well. But that one really, really clicked with me because I've been doing this doctorate on and off for several years now. And a good chunk of its of the theme is hauntology, like in the Derrida sense in French as well. And 
Ma- Fisher had this uh, ability because like the way I describe it, because I've been thinking about this as well, obviously in preparing for this episode is Derrida and a bunch of other folks focused a lot on like the ghosts of the past and how they haunt the present. So like the big example is obviously like the whole, the end of history in the early nineties, the declaration by Fukuyama and others. And Derrida comes along, writes this book called the Spectres of Marx and says that, well, actually, because you've declared the dead, it's now haunting you because nothing is ever fully over in that sense. I'm simplifying a bit, but that's kind of the gist of it. And Mark Fisher comes along and says, there's that, but there's also the, the not just him, there's uh, Avery Gordon, who has this term called haunted fut- futurities, if I'm pronouncing it right, and a bunch of other uh, scholars and like folks, uh, interesting folks thinking about, about it along these lines. But Fisher frames it in in this very interesting way. It's not just like the hauntings from the past, but it's also the hauntings of the futures that have never come to pass, right? And this could be anything from, even in the Arab world, for example, anything from like pan-Arabism or pan-Islamism or modernity or capitalism, what have you. If you look at the um, discourses and writings of this whole post-colonial uh, era, let's say 50s onward, especially 60s and 70s, uh, the visions were not the same, but they were all sort of promising a better future. They were all saying like the future will be better. And this is why it has to be under some kind of Arab identity or Islamic identity or uh, it's communism or it's capitalism or whatever. They all had this idea that the future will be better. And come roughly the um, more or less parallel to what was happening in the West along the same time, or roughly the 90s, 80s, 90s, this starts dissipating. This starts kind of even before the 9-11-2003 invasion of Iraq and that sort of everything that follows since then, that sort of started dying out. And so it was very interesting for me that he, Mark Fisher was writing this book and focusing on the UK and the US to some extent, but especially in the UK. And I'm like, well, this this looks, this sounds super familiar. Like, And this this ends up being bizarre you know it's a it's a bizarre experience to read this as a Lebanese who has this very different or seemingly different experience and Mark Fisher is describing something very specific you know 90s music scene early 2000s uh, sort of what what followed the whole Thatcher uh, revolution or counter-revolution or whatever and the advent of neoliberalism and I'm here from like this seemingly again different context and something very similar has been going on at the same time. So I can I can talk about this forever, but like what, talk to us a bit about like, what did you find useful or interesting or what have you in like that sort of framing, that sort of thinking? Yeah, a, a, a big thing for me is just like, especially at the times now is kind of grappling with climate anxiety and grappling with my own conceptions of the future. And so like, I think like a lot of people, I kind of fell into um, kind of a deep nostalgia of trying to find ways of thinking about the future. But every single time where I think about, okay, you know, what what would 10, 15, 20 years in the future look like? I always kind of came up against a wall of, well, we're either going to be in some kind of like nuclear dystopia or something like that, or it's going to look like. I don't know, this particular book that I read about, you know, um, solar uh, about cyberpunk or something like that. But I I never had a conception of like thinking outside of those terms of of thinking about this, this media that had, that I consumed over time that like, it felt like the, the future was literally canceled. Like I could only go back to past iterations or past ideas about the future and so like when i came across solar punk it was it was kind of a click because it combined a whole bunch of different topics that, that i felt at the time weren't really connected and kind of connected them i view i really do think like solar punk is a good catch-all term of like a whole bunch of different disciplines or ideas mm-hmm. that can combine together um but in general i think it's what caught me was finally being able to think like okay there actually is a viable future but it's in combining these things that most people wouldn't think about going together you know what i mean yeah uh but tell us more about that what are these things what are some of these things anyway (laughs) (laughs) well i guess like um a major part of that is 
the conception about like technology and ecology as well. Mm-hmm. So I, I think that kind of ties into degrowth, which is um, kind of a big social and political questioning of technology, of society, of civilization. I think a lot of people who have a lot of issues with how our current worlds are going and, and, and want a better future are questioning, okay, well, how would we get to a better future? Um, what kind of materials are going into that? You know, like how are we actually going to build this, this type of stuff? Um, mm-hmm. And I think that's a real actual concern that people have. And so when I thought about new futures, I, I saw the technology, but also like I think our conceptions of sci-fi almost always kind of stick to like, you know, shiny robots in the future. But who is making those robots? Where do the raw materials for those robots come from? Where does this shiny future actually legitimately come from? And so mm-hmm. thinking about um, technology and how that directly impacts ecology, especially going on to the future, because I mean, climate change is going to determine how we live in the future, whether or not we can adapt to climate change or adapt with climate change um, and change our ways of living, but not not also that, but like change our social arrangements as well. Um, Yeah. One, one, sorry. One of the, um, one of the kind of the slogans that I like from the degrowth movement is that like change is inevitable. The the main difference is whether it's changed by design or changed by disaster. I, whether like how much of his, how much of a say do we want to have in that change? Because just to, sorry to interrupt you, just yesterday, um, what are we recording this on October 13th? Just yesterday, I was in another part of Switzerland. I was taking part in this panel with, with uh, Julia Steinberger, who's a climate scientist. She, she co-wrote part of the IPCC reports and she's a good friend. And the conversation um, was essentially about um like different futures very similar to what were the kind of conversation we're having now um and at some point um it sort of dawned on me that part of the premise was flawed part of the premise of our conversation was flawed because the way it was framed by the the moderators the the, the you know the people who kind of decide on the on their decision and idea of what we're going to discuss is that okay we want to have this change but how do we convince enough people to join us and it kind of ended up for me feeling a bit too much of an individualistic thing like we just need to convince other people's which is important but like that's not the only thing that that needs to be done and i ended up saying like we're still framing and this is where mark fisher comes into like in, when we speak about um solar punk about degrowth about all of those uh potential ways forward out of our uh, out of uh what is up until now like a very very dark future we're always facing this wall of people or of media or whatever and this rhetoric of well that's not just re- that's not realistic like we have to be realistic about things again going back to capitalist realism and i obviously i brought up that point that realism is a it's kind of a very subjective thing it's very it's very socially conditioned it can be it's a social construct we might say and it can be constructed in a different way and so for me yeah, for me, I was like, uh, we we really need to understand that even when we uh, talk about uh, the economy, quote unquote, there's this term covers a lot. Like it's it says it hides a lot more than than it uncovers, if that makes sense. So yeah, just I, I wanted to add that. I don't want to didn't mean to interrupt. Oh no, not at all. I think that adds to the point of like you know when we're talking about being realistic about the economy and stuff like that. I think it's more um, detrimental and not realistic at all to assume that growth will be infinite for eternity. Like we're yeah. gonna have for forever constant growth, both from an economic sense and from like a material sense. Mm-hmm. Like we have we have finite resources on this planet, and so we can't continuously keep going on this growth paradigm and so like we really need to think about that because if we're talking about better futures we also have to talk about where these resources are coming from and the real realism is understanding that like we are coming to a point where um the constant growth of capitalism is going to have to stop. It's either going to have a plateau or a total crash because there are finite resources. And so really what we have to think about is what a new future look like if we changed our economic relations and our social relations 
to uh, question growth, but also think of things in new ways, you know? So like with technology, for instance, the reasons why technology is made the way that it is, is for profit, um, Mm -hmm. to maximize profit. And so we extract rare earth minerals to make high technology, uh, basically to create more profit. Um, And so when we're talking about building better futures, well, we also have to think, okay, well, can these technologies work in different ways? Can our ideas of technology and ecology change to where um, they don't rely on constant unending growth and instead, um, you know, our new futures can can question that, can question how we live at a fundamental level. And so that's where I think like a lot of what Mark Fisher was talking about was um, questioning at a fundamental level, our conceptions of the past and like our future conceptions of what a counterculture in the now would look like, like a, a future or a modern counterculture, mm. what what would that look like? And I think that's um, like a modern counterculture would borrow a lot from the degrowth movement, from a lot of different movements who are saying, hey, let's not go to the past. Let's look and try and create a future while also thinking about critically the parts of our day-to-day lives that are going to be impacted by climate change in the future. Exactly. Yeah. I, it, may, it just makes me think also like um, Julia, the scientist I mentioned, she had, she has given this example a few times of um, she assigned to her students. Um, I think I'm, I'm, I might misremember some of the details, but it was something along the lines of like, essentially like imagine a future scenario or uh, imagine like 20 years down the line, 30 years down the line um, and write about it, like write a fiction story or something along those lines. And they all had a lot of difficulties doing so. Um, and that's that's very significant. Like one, one example, and this is like stealing from Frederick Jameson's whole, uh, um, it's easier to imagine the end of the world and the end of capitalism. Uh, I think it's been attributed to either him or Zizek or some other, I mean, lots of folks have said this, but anyway. Uh, and basically, like, what I'm trying to say is also, like, it, uh, literally today, it's easier for a kid, I don't know, like, five years old, maybe, or eight or something, to imagine a zombie apocalypse than to imagine a positive future. You know, at the very least, at at some point in your teenage years, that becomes so much easier to do because so much of culture in general, pop culture, main culture, culture in general, things that people consume, especially um, a good chunk of movies, <laughs> uh, so many books, uh, so many TV series are about uh, the end of times in one way or another, or at least some kind of apocalyptic future or post-apocalyptic future, uh, Blade Runner, I don't know, I Am Legend, whatever, any, any of these things. And what I always try also kind of emphasize, and this is semi-jokingly, but it's true. Like when we watch a film like I Am Legend, uh, and I'm only mentioning this because I watched it a couple of months ago. It's not that good. But in the beginning of the film uh, is when you start seeing this whole up zombie, whatever they are, apocalypse started happening. And most people who watch that film end up identifying with the main character played by Will Smith, obviously. No one identifies with the most people who are dead within like five minutes, right? Like you don't, you're not the, you're not, you're never the person in the background. You're always the hero in those films. And that's, that's just not how anything works. That's just not reality. But this ends up actually informing a lot of what we end up thinking of as realism. And even in, uh, you know, um, I, I, I was, I, I, I got into at some point like the prepping world and that sort of thing. And there is a very toxic version of that, which I think most people are familiar and other, I feel like just more sober about things, but the more toxic version are the ones that see themselves as re- realists as well, because they end up having this idea. And here I'm referring to like people who say, well, you know, I'm going to have to have a, I don't know, bazooka in my bunker and shit like, you know, stuff like that. <laughs> you know, those, those are the folks who, who, who think that, well, it's, um, I, these are the tools that I need to survive. And what's often missing is, well, do I have enough friends? Like, do I, do I know 10 people who can be there for me or can I be there for them? Do I know my neighbors? You know, stuff like that. And because they, there is these mental shortcuts, I feel like, and you, they're often provided in through these films. And I say this because I genuinely thought like this for some time, for like a good chunk of my teenage Same. years, I think. Like, I Same. think because it's normal. It's just, it's an easy, 
like yeah of course everyone is evil except me and <laughs> of course they're gonna try and kill me or whatever and i need to survive and that that's how things are and i mean I, we're saying this a bit like half jokingly but honestly i think this this sort of cynical worldview actually informs a lot of for example climate change related discourses because most people are not hard climate deniers most i mean i don't i don't have statistics but i think most people are aware that there's something going on but they would be like what's called soft climate deniers i say like yeah it's it's a problem but like what can we do or we're doing the most that we can and even if you literally point them out like bullet point by bullet point like no we're not and this is why we're not and this is what we might do you know not that i necessarily have the answers but we have more answers than what is often portrayed or what is often talked about you know like there are concrete things that can be done and that climate scientists often talk about and have been actually more vocal about it julia was uh arrested two days before the day before our our um so a couple of days ago now, because she was blocking a highway to bring attention again to to this problem, and but it was part of this campaign called Renovate Switzerland, which are at, which are asking the government to fund uh, the renovation of buildings to make them more um, what's the word in English, um, so that like heat doesn't dissipate or there's a word sorry oh insulated. like insulated yeah exactly yeah thanks insulated. So anyway, all of this to say that like we're at the point now where like climate scientists are becoming activists. A bunch of people are starting to understand that neutrality is no longer possible. And what I think folks like us, if that's not too arrogant <laughs> of, <laughs> of me to say, can do is kind of complement the hard science. Because the hard science in and of itself is just, it's too much for most people. And it's just, it's not necessarily pointing to, well, okay, this is what needs to be done, but how can we do it? And how can we motivate people to do it? And how can we motivate ourselves to even believe that this is possible? And this is where I think, like, stuff, stuff, the stuff that you're talking about and what you've been writing about, and it's on your Substack, and you, you're also on this other podcast, which is lovely, called Solar Punk. Now, uh, I'll probably do some collaboration with, with them at some point, um, uh, which might be out before this is out. I, I don't know how timelines work on in podcast scheduling. But in any case, but all of this to say that there is like the the very hard sciencey work that needs to be done and that is being done and that is often actually constrained. Uh, the IPCC part of the critique of the IPCC reports is that it's constrained by quote unquote capitalist realism, right? Like you, like okay, you're telling us this, but what can we do about it? Because there, there we're not necessarily the only, the only audience. Obviously, it has to be a UN approved thing, and the main audiences are the nation states that signed on to the Paris Agreement and so on. And they have different priorities, or at least many of those governments have different priorities than just, quote unquote, tackling the climate climate crisis. They're happy to kind of pay lip service to it, but as long as it doesn't harm the priority, the actual priority, which is maintaining mm-hmm. capitalism and maintaining, quote unquote, economic growth. So I'll just let, give you some time to reflect on that because I feel like I've been rambling to, for too long. And then no, no. <laughs> listeners, <laughs> listeners should know that we uh, I sent you this Google Doc with like bullet points. And we're like at number two. <laughs> I just expected this was going to happen, but it's fine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I think that a lot of this has to do with the ideas of like pedagogy of like people have no clue what's out there because they have no clue that it exists. And so when you feel like there's no alternatives to reality because you've never really seen the alternatives or never really heard the alternatives, you kind of get stuck in this framework of thinking. And so like, I think that uh, subverting pedagogies of disaster of endless capitalism and endless growth, um, subverting those thoughts and trying to show people that there is an alternative, I think like kind of connects back to the psychedelic aspects of post-capitalist desire and of acid communism because it's not really necessarily all about um doing lsd and doing psychedelics it's really about um using the psychedelic to or really like art music feeling emotion combined with the logics of the hard sciences to subvert um kind of our our, our hard wall of thinking about the realities um and, and thinking about reality. So, you know, trying to, 
show people that, you know, this alternative exists is one thing, you know, speculation is one thing, just kind of like, oh, hey, here's a cool sci-fi reality that, you know, we're all talking about, you know, better futures and all this, but like, how does that actually happen? Or like, what's the hard science behind that, that would actually make that happen? And so I think it's really important to not just think in like speculative terms, but use speculation and fiction, um, use... And, and think about emotion. How do people feel? Like how a really big thing to me is, especially with science fiction and talking about futures and better futures is like, how would my day to day look like in a better future? How would my day to day life look like, um, you know, living and adapting with climate change? Um, if, if I can't see myself and feel myself in this new world, how am I supposed to have new thoughts about the future if I can't even imagine myself in it? And so, like, that's where I see the ideas of pedagogy, the ideas of acid communism and the psychedelic and using art, literature, music in a form that combines with the hard sciences to, like, actually convey what we're talking about. Um, because, yeah, I, I think a lot of people, when you when you throw the hard facts about climate change or the hard facts about some of the social um, issues that we have today, a lot of people shut down because they exactly they have no clue of what to do about it and so i think that a way around that is to say like here are some things that you can actually do but not on like an individualistic level not like oh prep for the future by you know uh, hoarding a bunch of beans and guns in a, in a in a bunker but understanding that like there's a difference between individual action and individualist action because individual action is with the end goal of collective action. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I guess I could talk, talk more about what I mean by that. So let's take, for instance, you know, an individual action with the end goal of a collectivist action. Mm -hmm. An individualist action might be you deciding to do like you deciding to make your own garden. For instance, let's start there. That's a very like common thing with solar punk is, is talking about community gardens, mm -hmm. um, food sovereignty, stuff like that. Um, it's technically an individual action, which a lot of people would say, OK, well, we're not going to be able to, to solve anything with just individual actions, which is true to a sense. But there needs to be the ability for people to understand that there are actions that you can take that snowball into collective action, that snowball into larger pushes towards things so individual start to garden they start out they start gardening you know learning more about the ecosystem um learning more from indigenous people about what the ecosystem looked like before all this development happened um and start getting more interested into the ecology okay that's great well that alone isn't going to solve climate change it's mm -hmm. going to solve a lot of the social issues that we have so this person starts growing more stuff they start having a little bit more surplus. They start sharing it with their neighbors. Um, then you're starting to talk about, okay, well, you're moving from individual action, not individualist, but individual action. And now you're starting to do kind of some forms of mutual aid, you know, sharing resources with your neighbors, starting to talk to people in your area. Um, maybe you convince them to start their own gardens of their own. And so now you're starting to see like one individual action start to, to, morph and change and more and more people are doing these sorts of things more and more people say in an area are starting to grow their their own food locally um and from that you know uh more and more neighbors are talking to each other growing their own separate gardens together talking to each other and they're like okay let's start a community garden um so that way everybody in the community can have access to food and so you know you start starting a community garden people start um you know, meeting up at this at this place and meeting up at the garden, helping each other out, giving out food. There's more surplus. That surplus, you know, goes towards feeding people who actually need it, meeting the actual needs of people directly. Um, and from there, you know, you start to create a real community and things spiral from there. Things snowball and grow together. So you have like the start of an individual action that with the end goal has a collective action and all it really takes is for that to combine together with other people to really start making larger changes. And so um, I think that there are 
um, definite differences between like individual and collective, but I think that both of them are intertwined. The collective action um, can start on the individual on the collective action can start on the individual level, but mm-hmm. also the individual level can't start without the collective thought and the collective pedagogy or the collective like you know idea that a better future is possible um you know i'm thinking that a lot of what we're talking about sort of already exists in in part of popular culture even as cliches right like in you have i don't know like they didn't know it was impossible so they did it you know stuff like that (laughs) and what's always funny about that is that people end up i think i could be wrong but i think that these uh cliches let's say end up kind of being diluted because they have to fit a the world. They have to, quote unquote, be realistic. So something like you can do anything that you want, that you put your heart, your mind to, you know, stuff like that ends up actually being about, you know, how can you be more efficient at your job? Or, you know, how can you write a better CV? You know, stuff, um, you know, stuff like that. Yeah. <laughs> and my my thing in I, I I mentioned these examples because also part of what I try to do is have examples that are actually relatable and use that to make this other points. So one thing I actually enjoy doing a lot is talk a lot about known TV series and known movies. I talk about the Avengers a lot because I feel like most people have seen them. Um, you know stuff like that or cultural references that. I don't know if um, I have no idea if maybe someone who's actually younger than me would know like the Jetsons and the Flintstones and stuff like that. Um, because something that's very interesting with our generation ish and maybe like millennials, Gen Z, roughly that, that age bracket. So forties and under ish, I guess is obviously the internet and those who remember slightly a time before the internet or those who basically just grew up with it or those who grew up with, you know, web 1.0, 2.0, whatever, those kinds of differences for me are super interesting because now the internet is sort of this memory box in many ways where we're able to go back to stuff in the past and then it ends up being memeified and it's it it it's end up it ends up becoming this very interesting sometimes dark <laughs> but when not dark interesting thing like this tool at the end of the day and i find it very interesting to go through stuff like uh, just a few days ago i learned and i was looking at it while you were talking but so the jetsons premiered 60 years ago uh this wow. year 2022 and it's set in 2062, uh, because this whole 100 year in the future thing. And uh, the the guy, the main guy, Joe Jetson, is supposed to be 40. And so he was born in this year. He was born in 2022 in the timeline of the of the thing. And obviously in that in that universe, for those who don't know, I mean, just write the Jetsons with a J on YouTube, find the trailer. That that's the gist of what we're talking about. It's uh, you know, futuristic uh, multi planetary species and whatnot what's kind of funny about that is that even though they're in a different on a different planet and whatnot it's still capitalist they're still shopping you know there's still uh, traditional gender roles of like women doing the housework the robot is like an automated robot who is a woman who does all the housework (laughs) like it's fucking crazy yeah yeah yeah. exactly (laughs) but so if you're watching this in 2062 and i don't know hopefully i'm old enough to do that by then but uh i'm around i mean uh it it's not probably 2062 would not look like the 2062 and the Jetsons. I mean, probably. I'm not going to jinx it, but probably. And at the very least, gender roles, which is a good thing, are definitely will definitely not be like that. I mean, again, I don't want to jinx things, but hopefully. Fingers um, crossed. <laughs> fingers crossed. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's just so interesting because then what you actually remember is that this is the future as imagined by those writers and creators and whatnot in 1962. And it's still interesting, like despite the flaws, it's still interesting to watch stuff like that. And that's why I'm so into Star Trek as well for the same reason, because I I was watching. Uh, so I, I saw. I don't know if you know a bit about. So there's the Next Generation, which is a super popular one, but there is the first one before that, which is the original series. And the original series TOS is the one that I'm now watching. I hadn't actually watched it before. It's old Mr. Spark, that sort of thing. And but the gender roles in in TOS are much more to my eyes, antiquated, or they have not aged well whatsoever, then even in TNG, which is not perfect, and there are still stuff, you know, but it's there's a huge le- leap between, and that's like a few years in between them. In the first one, it's really like women are literally dressed in a certain way. 
uh, sexualized in a certain way. And almost always there's some kind of submissive role in one way or another. And it's always the guys doing things and whatnot. And the, the radical thing at the time is that they're just not all white guys. <laughs> you know, so if, if you're non-white guys. <laughs> um, but again, the, it's set even further than 2062. I actually don't know on the spot, which is embarrassing. But it's like 200 years in the future or, so, or 300 years in the future or something like that. And it's still like, okay, technology is a bit better and more interesting and whatever. But gender roles are basically the 1960s America, you know, white America specifically. And this is what the future looks like. Even the alien species are mostly white people, <laughs> you know, and complete, not even humans, like just different species, completely humanoids, as they call them, are yeah. mostly white people. And that that says a lot, but it says a lot for me today, like from my perspective today, I'm sure there were small people even in the 1960s who were writing about that. But I, I think not enough, probably, compared to what we have today. And that's a good thing. And so for me, the advantage of what we have now, just the, the tools of the internet, having access to certain websites, I don't know, whatever, despite all of their flaws, like a YouTube or a Netflix or whatever, is being able to, if you're so minded, if that's what you're looking for, look at all of those older sci-fi films and TV series, which for me are always more evocative than than reading a book, which is amazing as well. But it's because like literally how did they picture it and how did they literally film it? You know, it's, it's always very interesting. So all of this to say that what they were writing, let's say the Jetsons or Star Trek in the 1960s, for them, they were imagining a future that was realistic. Like these are not... Uh, it's not fantasy. It's not like we're not talking about elves and, and whatever, orcs and whatever, like in Lord of the Rings. We're talking about, well, okay, it's going to be more high tech, but there's a reason, there's a, there's a logic to that high tech. You know, it's scientific and somehow. And okay, we can comment on the technology, but they also had a social commentary that for them, they assumed that 300 years into the future, well, of course, gender roles are going to be that way because why wouldn't they, you know, like, and th these assumptions carried them, so to speak, 200, 300 years, and it colored what they thought the future would be like. So yeah. this is why I, I just find it, and I, it's maybe I, I tell myself I'm doing like research when I watch Star Trek or something to kind of <laughs> like, oh, I'm not wasting my time now. I'm doing research, you know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think that like, you know, it kind of goes back to hauntology of like, even if you're thinking of the future, you're still using the same ideas that were like so locked into the past. Um, and I think it's, that's, that's honestly easier for a lot of, for a lot of people um, is to hang on to these old frameworks because it's, it's a lot easier to just hold on to them than it is to just think about something new. Um like I think that like British monarchy stuff, uh, you know, those series where you have, I don't know. Uh, what's it? Downton Abbey, you know, The Crown, you know, it's very easy because it's like it's set in time. They're set in their ways. People know their roles more or less. And you kind of lose yourself in that world. You're one of them, you know, in that, in that sense. It's kind of play acting. You're, you're, you're really putting yourself in that world. I mean, I, I don't, but folks do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. And it's simple. It's easy because you, you things are laid out in specific ways. There is a social hierarchy that you, that's easy to understand. There, there is a, a economic hierarchy that's easier to understand. And so to think about the future is, well, let's maintain these hierarchies. Let's maintain these social arrangements because it's easier uh, to conceptualize our lives around it. And so like, yeah, you see with a lot of, especially right-wing media um, it is extremely looking towards um, the past. It's locked into the past because that's easier to maintain is easier to conserve these past thoughts when thinking about a future. Um and it's easier to, to maintain that simplicity because when you look at a lot, even a lot of like right wing and, and especially fascist talking points, they always revolve around um, appeals to emotion that don't involve, first of all, don't involve logic in any sense. And second of all, are always extremely simple. They're easy quips to just throw out when when you talk about, you know actual logical arguments we're talking about, especially leftist arguments are based in, you know, um, reasoning with 
logic and all this kind of stuff. It's harder to maintain those quips and just throw out these easy to say um, simplistic arguments because what we're talking about isn't simple. There's a lot of nuance. There's a lot of sliding scales between things. Take, for instance, gender, you know, uh, a sliding scale on on gender and sexuality that isn't black and white. There is no simplicity. And so it's really hard to just easily throw out, oh, here's a simplistic answer to uh, gender roles, for instance, because we have to talk about all these things that are behind just something that seems so simple as like, you know, how do people who are gendered as male or gendered as female socially i mean um how do these people interact and why do these gender roles happen well you know you have to go into the background of patriarchy you have to go into the background of all these different things whereas um i i'd say like right-wing fascist traditionalism can very easily say well that's just the way that things are um and so we kind of see this reflected in our ways of conceptualizing the future because it's a lot easier to just remain in the past to remain in these like strict roles, you know? So like when you're talking about um, Star Trek and imagining the future and ha- and the fact that like, it still feels like the 1960s, like that's the goal for some people because they can't even imagine getting past those points. And so I think that, yeah, like it's super important to, to be able to, to say like there's there is a very good alternative to what we're talking about and when we could when we think about the future we can't rely on these like really simplistic old ways of thinking maybe we should question the foundations of all this stuff that we're talking about um and what's um very even even about the example you mentioned like the i the the whole right wing um nostalgia for lack of a better term nostalgia is a kind of a it's a loaded term here but um, a lot of it, for example, if I think of quote unquote traditional masculinity, I would hear in the US context, um, a lot of it would be reference to, I don't know, a John Wayne figure or something like that. And the whole, you know, Wild West and whatever, stuff like that. But those are movies. And a lot of those movies are not based on something that actually happened. It's just an imag- it's an imagination of people in the 1950s-ish 40s, 50s, I guess, of what a hundred years before that looked like, and it's not necessarily the most accurate representation of the past. And obviously, there's the erasure of indigenous folks, which I, I think is pretty obvious at this point, or just like actually uh, treating them as as the people to literally murder, which is also in many of those uh, in that in that genre. But anyway, the point to say is that uh, you have this entire masculinity, which was then embodied by someone like Ronald Reagan, a literal actor, and uh, people who wouldn't in a, I don't know, if I'm thinking of the evangelical uh, right-wing Christians who kind of voted for for that because they became political really around the same time, opposed Jimmy Carter, um, the, the, they, they, they projected on this empty vessel in many ways what they thought he was about and what he was defending. And obviously, I think it's even more obvious with the figure of Donald Trump, who's mm-hmm. as not what supposedly what they stand for. But the point is, what I'm trying to say is that they don't actually stand for that. And the other uh, example that is taken, I think, even more for granted, like when I give the example of John Wayne and I go, oh, masculinity, whatever, a lot of folks, especially of a certain political tendency, let's say, wouldn't they wouldn't they wouldn't debate me or disagree with me. Ah, oh, yeah, this is obvious. Uh, sure. Talk, okay. Uh, lefties and whatever. So they would agree with that, obviously. But then when I talk about cars and how there is actually a, it is a car culture uh, that has been very much in many ways purposefully designed that way in many of those movies. And I have the receipts. Pe- book, people have written books on this. It's not, it's not like some conspiracy. It's, it doesn't take rocket science really. Yeah. Um, and th- then there is a direct correlation between, for example, imagining owning a car with freedom you know well now you can and there's a masculinity aspect to this as well although the uh, car companies have tried to have a quote-unquote feminist version of that as well (laughs) of like you know you own your own car and then you can go wherever and you you know drive into the distance and you're free and you know that sort of thing and there is a there's a direct correlation if not causation between this and then not having good public transportations you know there is a direct like we can literally go through the timeline of where these things have been happening especially in the u.s uh 
to a lesser extent, thankfully for me, because I'm in Europe, in Europe, but in Europe it has happened as well. And now it ends up becoming, again, we're facing today, literally today, an energy crisis, which would objectively be alleviated by with a transition to uh, green energy. And at the same time, because that's not enough, a reduction of car use being faced, which is supposed should be the realism, but being faced with the whole, oh, you're not being realistic. People are going to need cars. And so obviously then the only acceptable discussion or debate, if you want, because they, they end up, they usually what ends up being um, the acceptable framework, let's put it that way, is, well, obviously we need to transition to electric cars. You know, like that's, it's like, cool, maybe like 1% of humans, maybe, I don't know, but the majority this case literally is not possible. There is literally not enough. It's not possible to have every single human being use yeah. an electric car. We just do not have enough minerals for that. And not that it wouldn't even be desirable would that be the case because public transportation, objectively, already proven a billion times, is more efficient. It's just more efficient. And so if exactly. we're talking about where we want to, capitalism is supposed to be this thing where because of the magic of the market and supply and demand, blah, 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 the most efficient thing is obviously going to be the one that's going to be prioritized. Then it fought, it clashes completely <laughs> with the reality of things that actually these things are as of now being artificially supported, artificially in quotation, as in subsidized by governments. Mo- vast majority of airports are subsidized because they would collapse without it. And so we're yeah. not talking about do we believe in the magic of the market because they don't seem to even believe in it in the first place. No, because it's all based off of these like imaginaries and these these things that because they want to return, and I use they as you know not really a a, a, a giant like term, but you know people want to imagine um, the past that isn't real. It isn't based in reality, and so like yeah, like you said, like we can't even ima- we can't even conceptualize like getting around not using cars we can't even think about a world without cars because our past has been so tainted by cars and like every single piece of media that we see in the past is so related to cars for a very specific reason um and there are so many car ads all the time 24 yeah. <laughs> 7 regardless of what you're doing there's a car ad <laughs> <laughs> and so like yeah like we can't even think about the past in a way that's based in reality because if we're thinking about a past based in reality we can see that there's plenty of cities that were that had robust public transport that had actual like electric powered trolley systems that were efficient that didn't require fossil fuels that we would consider to be futuristic that were happening in like the you know the late 1800s that were systematically destroyed by car culture um, and so like, yeah, it, it ends up going back to our pedagogy, our ideas of what reality, quote unquote, would actually like entail. And our reality is it, it has been hijacked because we can't um, look at the reality of the future and the past because we're so stuck in these like made up conceptions of whatever we think should be happening in the in, in the past and the future. Yeah, oh, that's interesting. <laughs> <laughs> so to come, come go back to solar punk a bit you know i weirdly enough while i was so i discovered solar punk about two years ago on this podcast actually i had a friend emmy bevancy and at the end of every episode as we'll do as well this time or this time around i asked folks to recommend like three books and so on and uh, emmy basically said uh they recommended a couple of books and then and honestly anything that's afrofuturist or solar punk uh, because I find it, and I'm paraphrasing, I find it Im- impressive or inspiring that people are still able to even have hope, you know, that sort of thing. So Solar Punk, obviously, it clicked, and I did like what most people do. I wrote Solar Punk on Google, and I found uh, Andre's video, What is Solar Punk on YouTube? Uh, Saint uh, Andrew, sorry. Saint Andrew, as they were, they were, uh, he was known back then. I think now it's just called Andrewism. It's on YouTube. People can just write What is Solar Punk? And in any case, they can listen to the podcast because I interviewed him as well. And, um, and that clicked. It's like, well, th- this is what I was thinking about. I just didn't have a term for it. It's just, uh, it, it is because it's that thing, like in a time of where uh, the status quo is hopeless, um, 
then hope can be radical. Hope can be, you know, it doesn't have to be. It could be an escape, which it might be needed for some folks. Uh, you know, no judgment there. Uh, but, you know, it can be radical if done in a certain way, uh, including what we're talking about here. And another thing that I kind of like is this idea, uh, which I've been kind of thinking about that, because I've, I've had this question a number of times, because obviously the stuff that I do for some uh, context, or I think listeners already know by this, but this by now, sorry. But like I, I, I write about and I work on pretty depressing stuff most of the time. So what I do, like my PhD is depressing as fuck. Like there's just no way around it. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's on hauntings and trauma and those who were forcibly disappeared in Lebanon and the civil war. And it's like there's. But the last chapter is slightly more, uh, quote unquote, optimistic or more positive, you might say. But it, it's it's a heavy topic. It's a very, and I watch films and documentaries that are just by their very nature very very difficult to go through. Mm-hmm. And so the the general question, they often something I often get is like, well, you know, how do you still have hope after this? And you know, and the answer often is no, not necessarily. <laughs> But I, I sort of have come to a, I've come to terms with, and this may, it's just like my own thing, is that even when I don't have hope, I try and create hope. So or if, if I don't have hope, I try and read and consume or observe or whatever other folks who, when I'm listening to them or viewing them or whatever, they seem to have hope. Maybe maybe by the time I've listened to their stuff, they've lost hope. I don't know. But it's like, <laughs> this is the advantage of, of the internet, obviously, is that the timelines can be a bit more flexible so to speak like temporality itself is becoming a bit more uh, all over the place it's not it's not just like you know past present future in this sort of like linear timeline and for me that that sort of thing and it there's a bit of a um even useful um lesson there in some sense because even when i don't feel the hope i may still do something which can ins- can help someone else have hope, if that makes sense. So even if I'm not personally feeling particularly great today, which is uh, pretty common, it's not. I'm not. I don't necessarily wake up and feel amazing. <laughs> it takes me some time, and I have depression and that sort of thing. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, but I I kind of go from go from the assumption that there is a lot of horrible stuff happening in the world and you know, there's, there's no, there's no point of sugarcoating it. It is, it's very difficult and it's, it's, it's horrible suffering, all of these things, which I work on as a, as a journalist as well. Mm-hmm. But in the same way as it is impossible, literally impossible for me to consume all of that uh, news, let's say, or to even think about all of that stuff at the same time, because there's just too much. It's just not physically possible. It's also impossible for me to uh, keep track of all of the positive stuff that are happening or people are thinking about or writing or doing literally act act you know act uh, sorry like direct action or activism or that other sort of thing because for the most part you, you do, there's no need if you're doing community gardening which is having a genuine like real impact for like hundreds of people let's say you won't necessarily live stream every single day because the entire point is that you're being present now in the moment with these other folks and something yeah. is being built often slowly but surely and it's it's very valuable. And so I try and remember this, but this requires, if I may put it that way, a bit of imagination. It's just not, it's not imagination in the sense that, again, I'm not imagining elves and orcs and you know Middle Earth and that sort of thing. I'm literally going from a very rational assumption a very basic assumption that well someone is probably doing this now because there's too many of us and someone is doing it you know it's just it's gonna happen and that's a good thing so i'm gonna kind of focus on that a bit and maybe even seek them out if possible because it doesn't take that long that much again another advantage of of the internet so anyway all of this to say to kind of wrap up on my point that in the same way as i don't um when I read a difficult book or I, I, I see something that's very difficult and depressing and, and, and traumatic in many cases and so on, it's not that I then, I need to desperately, um, uh, I don't know, filter it with some happy thoughts. You know, I don't know, ha- think happy thoughts. No, no, that's not how it works. I, when, when this is happening, it's just, this is just what it is and it's very horrible and it's very sad and very difficult, et cetera, et cetera, and traumatic, as I said. But it's just that what then helps me is that it ends up, I end up grounding myself and reminding myself that even if my personal experience, because that's also happened to me, it's not just like 
a foreign thing or something that's happening, quote unquote, on the news. Mm. But maybe now I'm not in a good space and mental space, uh, maybe sometimes physical space as well. Mm -hmm. But doesn't necessarily mean that this is the end. And for me, this is the dif this is the difficulty of this is the the role of the imagination is that it allows me to actually um, putting it a bit more dramatically, like live for another day, you know, live live until next week, until next month, until something else happens. And in the mm -hmm. meantime, when I can, I don't always manage to do so. Always easier to preach than you know to actually do things. But sometimes I try and do that. Um, I, I create, as I said, create hope even when I don't have create something that is hopeful that can be hopeful for someone else, even when I don't personally, in this moment, even as I am doing it, feel it in that sense because I may feel it later, but someone yeah. else can feel it now. Yeah, I mean that's that's the constant thing that I'm like, you know, coming across is coming to the realizations about about my own life and about the future it it, it is bleak um you know we, we can't just say oh yeah everything's gonna be fine we can imagine better futures blah 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 while we can do that we have to come to the realization that the path that we're on um is extremely dangerous um a, a lot of the assumptions that we had or a lot of the assumptions that we were given especially our generation from our parents is that things will continue as they always have for them and their parents and their grandparents and so like for, especially for me when i think about the future um it, it, it's kind of counterbalanced with the fact that like you know i'm not going to ever retire I'm constantly going to have to deal with climate change. I'm constantly going to have to deal with natural disasters impacting my life with the economic disasters impacting my life. And so it, it's very, very easy to fall into uh, a rut of inaction and saying like, well, I guess I'll just give up. And it's like, no, when you look at all of human history, when all of this stuff is happening, there are for sure people who give up, but there are plenty of people who say there is something worth fighting for. There is something worth on the horizon, even if it's just imaginary, even if it's just, you know, a concept of, of you know, uh, maybe this possible future might happen. There are stuff, there is stuff to keep fighting for. Um, and there are concrete things that I can do even in the moment that doesn't seem like it'll have an impact. So like, you know, if I'm having a really bad day, sometimes it just helps to, go out in the garden, plant something, work outside. And it helps to work on like, you know, a, a little project here and there, or, you know, sit down and, and imagine what would the future look like? What would a great future in my eyes look like? And think like, okay, well, if I'm imagining a better future and I'm imagining all these cataclysmic things happening, what, what kind of solutions or what, what kind of things can we do to mitigate those risks? Like what, what can we do to make people's lives better or even like good in these cataclysmic times? And so then, you know, you're starting to think of like, okay, well, there is a glimmer of hope. There, there are things that we can do to change the paths that we're on. And what are some concrete things that we can actually do in the here and now that will lead to these types of things what are some things that i can do or even a small group of people can do um at a community level on a local level to it really impact change at a broader way you know mm -hmm. like starting from the small group of people doing direct action and leading into um some really amazing collective action happening i mean like you look at something like occupy wall street um that was a really interesting time happening. And I think that another closer thing that we got to um, another kind of counterculture starting to grow was people getting fed up and seeing the economic collapses happening, seeing the Iraq war happen, seeing everything that was happening at that time and saying, you know, like maybe we should just do something, just do anything um, to have a glimmer of hope for the future. And so, you know, even just small actions eventually blew up into what became Occupy Wall Street and became uh, so many actions during that time was just from even just a small group of people saying, you know, like, I've had enough. I want to do something. I want to do anything to, 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 to change this. So, yeah, I don't know. It's hard. <laughs> it is. I mean, it, none of this is e easy, really. Um, 
by final truth, and also to anticipate, because I have been in, or at least I've heard conversations about Occupy Wall Street where some people say, well, you know, it didn't achieve anything and that sort of thing. But really, the, the point is that, A, we need to ask ourselves, what, what does achieve mean? How, you know, that's an entirely different debate. But, but what I'm trying to say is that I've been following protest movements and protests and uprisings and revolutions for about since I took part in one <laughs> in Lebanon in 2015. <laughs> so roughly since 2015, less active before that, but a bit before that, but especially since 2015, I've seen in Lebanon two different massive uprisings. And I found it very interesting to actually compare them, 2015 and 2019. 2019, a lot of the lessons from, the mistakes from 2015 were learned. Not all of them. And there were still limitations and there were stuff that, I would have liked done in a different way, but whatever. There were there were still like disagreements because obviously, especially when you're in a situation where you have mass mobilization, it's not like a million something out of like were five million in Lebanon. Uh, like, there's gonna be a lot of folks there, and they're not all in the same page. You know, there's maybe this one thing in common, but that's kind of about it. Everything else is we're not we're not friends, you know. <laughs> um, but you have to find a way to make something work. And so, of course, in in that protest movement, you will have different, you know, usually how this happens. Oh, the more radicals, the more moderate, the more maybe conservatives, people who are sort of on the fence, who maybe attend once a week. You know, you'll have different roles. And I used to kind of frown upon that or find it very tiring. But I've been kind of revisiting even my own emotions back then because th- there was a very distinct different set of emotions between those those four years. And obviously growing up, you know, becoming a bit more mature, whatever, all of these things. And I end up actually appreciating a bit more that we're not all on the same page. Because I would be I would be weirded out if actually everyone's agreeing with me here. Uh, it's just, I, I need to see, and that that's just, a, again, a cliche for a reason, but you need a bit of everything to kind of make the world work. And in those mo- moments when you really, really see that, more concretely in any situation, whether it's a protest movement or trying to build some kind of community, what well, community, <laughs> to build a community, you will have different skills that you can offer, but you don't necessarily have to have every, you don't have to, that's the difference between the smart prepping, quote unquote, and here I'm being a bit simplistic, and the kind of more, I'm going to bazooka in my bunker ones, where the one of them assumes that I, I cannot be a doctor and an engineer and a gardener and a cook and a, I don't know, the carer who's taking care of three kids. And it's not possible. Therefore, I need other folks who can do that. <laughs> and so it's easier to have this idea of, uh, and of course, we can learn from each other. We can then divide tasks, what have you. But then the idea is that you can bring something to the table and anyone who's listening I have done this a billion times and it's always, it, it starts with disbelief and then it's more like, well, this is obvious. It's already, it starts with disbelief and I wanted that when you point out the, well, what are your skills? What do you like to do? What what can, because you can also learn, you can grow. It doesn't have to be, you don't have to be the perfect artist immediately or the perfect gardener, which doesn't exist anyway, but you don't have to have all of those skills any, immediately. You can want to do that, and maybe this is an opportunity to do that. You can help create the opportunity to do that. And then, you know, one thing follows the other. And as you said, it can start from an individual effort. I started gardening on my own with my wife. And then now we're actually thinking of we want to expand it to a more community level. There's a community garden nearby that we just haven't visited yet, and it's like five minutes away. You know, like stuff like that. And a lot of the time, it's really, it comes down to, what are the stuff on a daily basis that are preventing you from exploring these different options? And why does it often always comes, does it often come down to with, oh, well, it's just not a realistic thing to do now. I can do it tomorrow, maybe, or after tomorrow or in 10 months or whatever. But like now I, you know, I need to work or, okay, let me rephrase this slightly because obviously there is, there's an element where we still live in capitalism and there are folks and many folks myself included will have you know work hours and whatnot and so i'm not saying i hope people understand what i'm trying to say here but i'm not saying um it's just about changing your mindset no no that that's the entire problem actually is that we have structures that prevent us from uh 
being free essentially from having experimenting and not having to worry about uh, you know roof over your head and paying rent and paying getting food and you know that sort of thing what i'm trying to say is that even despite all of those restrictions and i know from folks who are even who have been in even worse situations than me um there are ways of pl planting the seeds going to be cheesy about it planting the seeds for something that will later on be helpful meaningful you know help you happier be happier and so on and so forth and in order to do that even that the mindset the 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 motivation if you want because being motivated being demotivated is a very common problem these days even motivated long enough to even want to do something or start doing something that you may not see the result of for some time weeks months maybe even years that is where for me imagination comes into play and the more it is done the less individuals will have to do the hard work to constantly have to imagine it and this goes back to again if you're like seven you know what a fucking zombie is and you don't but you don't know how to imagine a, a happy future you know stuff like that and mm -hmm. i i just want to make that work that imagine it or we like it should it should be easier to uh it should hopefully eventually become easier to do that imagination work and it also it no longer feeling like much work if that makes sense it's just becoming actually part of the ether so to speak in the same way as things like black lives matter or the me too movement and that sort of thing which you know as with everything will have flaws and whatnot but in the same way as it felt almost overnight that a whole bunch of people it clicked it clicked in their mind that well this is not good it needs to be changed now you know but of course it was not overnight and that's the point that's i guess the entire point exactly. of, i rambled a lot sorry but that's obviously the point of what we were trying to get at here no yeah i mean there's a lot of background stuff that that ends up uh, coalescing and then all of a sudden you feel like oh this came out of nowhere well no this came out of somewhere mm -hmm. all this stuff comes from somewhere because there are people who are constantly in the background who are constantly uh, working and thinking about these things and then all of a sudden it comes up because well I mean there's a there's, there's a massive change mm -hmm. um, and I think that like imagining um, will always happen. And I think of like all these things as sparks. There's never like an end goal. There's never going to be uh, some cataclysmic thing that happens that, oh, the end is here. Okay, well, great. We've solved everything. No, every single protest movement, every single thing that's happened, the counterculture from the 60s, all these things were sparks that will light the fires for the next spark, that will mm -hmm. light the fires for the next spark, that will carry on and carry on. And we'll see these changes happening. I mean, e even in my lifetime, seeing the changes have happened from, um, <clears throat> say, for instance, like from Ferguson, uh, the protests that happened in Ferguson into now, mm -hmm. the amount of social change that we've had in America when we think about um, uh, race and social politics, especially for, for black people in the U.S., has changed so much because these sparks have ignited something. The, sure they have you know a, a lot of these things have been kind of like put out or put down from outside forces from the u.s government from capitalism um trying to make sure that these changes don't happen but it's we've seen so much social change happen and it's not gonna be a end all be all mm -hmm. here we go it's all figured out you mm -hmm. know so mm -hmm. i think that um that was a huge thing in um Mark Fisher's work as at communism was, was trying to point out that this wasn't the counterculture didn't fail. Oh, there were a lot of failures between like, you know, the end goals that people had, but that was just the beginning. The counterculture made such a huge impact on society, not just the U S but the world over into uh, thinking in new ways. Um, whether or not you want to say that the counterculture created neoliberalism, it's more so that neoliberalism filled the void yeah. of what happened after the counterculture. Yeah. So, you know, we, we can look at failures, wins, whatever, or we can look at things as a slow and steady progress to the futures that we imagine the futures that we want to happen and instead of looking at things as like uh black and white as wins and failures um we can look at them as steps towards 
the new imaginings. And, you know, as we kind of progress through and our, and our, and our conceptions about like culture and society and each other changes, that will also change how we imagine the future going on from there. So it's like, I, I don't know. I, I tend to kind of think of it as like, not necessarily stepping stones, mm-hmm. but we're building on top of the past, but also trying to reimagine the future based on other changes that we've had along the way. Mm-hmm. Um, and yeah, and, and, and imagining changing our conceptions about kind of like the fundamental stuff that we're talking about is how we get to this next step, how we get to these next, you know, how we get to these next movements. Um, Cause I really do feel like, you know, especially now with kind of the climate socially of like Gen Z and millennials, um, we're starting to see like the anti-work movement starting to really grow. We're starting to see people um, especially you know, after 2020 and with the pandemic, um, we start to see a lot of people being radicalized Mm -hmm. from being able to kind of slow down and really think about their lives and think about uh, capitalism and think about how their lives were impacted by the pandemic, by the mass death that we saw. Um, And so with all that happening, I think that's really uh, combining together to create kind of the the kindling for a new fire, for a new spark of whatever countercultural thing that we're going to see with Gen Z and millennials um, in in the near future. And all of that has to hinge on us being able to imagine how we can change our culture and society uh, to fit new realities, you know, Mm -hmm. like if I compare how, um, you know, as a millennial, uh, compared to how I view the future of let's let's say you know like gender or race relations as a kid, it's totally different. Um, right. And same with Gen Z. So it's like learning from each other. Now the world's completely different. I, I would say socially, we start to see these things change um, from even like five ten years ago, and so now the conceptions of like getting rid of gender roles or understanding gender on a spectrum or understanding how race and capitalism works together. Now we can have an even deeper view and even better imagination for the future of like what getting past all that will look like. You know, I'm actually thinking because as we're recording this, the protests are ongoing in Iran and mm-hmm. for about, uh, I think it's going to be three weeks now or something. Hopefully by the time this is out there ongoing or something positive has happened. Uh, who knows? Um, but a good chunk of them are being led by what we're, what you can call Gen Z. Uh, like a very, very good, uh, decent percentage um, in the main cities, in, in the regions and so on. And those are folks that for the most, I mean, all of them, they haven't lived through obviously the 79 revolution and they haven't lived through the 80s which was the very bloody war between iraq and iran and they haven't lived through more i mean obviously what happened in the 90s which was not that pretty either and in many ways there and here i'm generalizing a bit because you will have conservatives who are gen z as well you'll have like supporters of status quo who are in it's not like all it's not all black and white obviously but just the the point isn't that everyone has to be on board no it's never the case that everyone is on board that has never literally never happened if i'm not mistaken when martin luther king was assassinated like that here he was still in the polls like one of the most unpopular black men among white americans for example like, folks don't like to think about this as much now, I suppose, but it's just a fact. That's just what it was. And same for like the suffragettes in the UK. Like those are things that many, many I, I would assume folks know about maybe that like they were not actually popular in the sense of how they were being portrayed. Eventually, they became popular after winning, essentially, or at least after forcing the government for, for to some concessions. But the point is that what is it, what it is, what was it that drove them to be motivated enough to sort of push through that final goal, so to speak. And how can we emulate that energy, but on a scale that has, as of now, never been achieved? Obviously, we're talking about the global scale or as global as possible, because as I said, like you will never have everyone on board that that will not. It's physically you just don't have the time to do that anyway. But how do you get enough folks on board that 
for at, at, at best enough other folks accept that, well, this seems to be a better future. This seems to be a better change. This seems to be actually um, better, as I said. And for me, like the, the, the notion, the, the challenge is when I'm in, and I think of it very concretely, because I think this is when we talk about very big concepts and bringing it back to like the personal level often allows me at the very least, and I would hope listeners kind of digest things a bit better. And so when I think of like, okay, I'm sitting at a, I don't know, family lunch or something like that. And I'm with folks, you know, relatives and so on who don't necessarily share my politics. I mean, they don't. Uh, you have some things in common, but, you know, for the most part, if you're quote unquote the activist in the family, you're often facing people who they don't see themselves as activists because they see themselves as the realists. They see themselves as, well, this is just the way things are. And there's a reason why the way things are are the way they are. And then if you get to a conversation again, where you're actually trying to deconstruct, like let's deconstruct why are they the way they are and can they be different maybe? And how can they be different and how can we achieve that and so on? It's not that they, and I, I say this because this has happened. It's not that they um, disagree with me, but it's still not enough to convince them that it is possible. And so, Again, it goes back, even if they agree with the facts, like I, even if I'm literally just printing out IPCC reports and just saying literally this is what the scientific status quo is and this is what we need, we know we need to do. And like it's even if I do my homework, so to speak, and it's not just, oh, this is like how I, I want things to be and whatnot, that you, you, can, you will still often, and this has been my experience, come across, again, this wall of it's not realistic. It's, you know, this is just how things are. And then obviously, because I'm 31 and I've been doing this now for some time, I end up actually questioning, well, where is their framework coming from? What, what is their assumption and why do they have that assumption? And I can reach some conclusions based on what they know about their lives and what they have grown up, maybe in, the case, in this case, Lebanon or where they currently live, you know, stuff like that. I can reach some kind of picture which at least allows me to be slightly more patient <laughs> when <laughs> when when I hit that wall, right? Because that that's very important. Is that at the end of the day, if and I think of it that way, like if I manage to convince uh, this aunt or this neighbor or this whatever that this isn't just desirable, but it's feasible, it's possible. I would find I would consider that a small kind of maybe symbolic, not that symbolic, an actual victory, actual win, because that yeah. tells me that this that specific messaging worked in that specific context, and I end up kind of realizing that the message cannot always uh, the the kind of the methodology can't always be the same. I can't mm -hmm. immediately go to everyone and talk about sci-fi and Star Trek and solar punk and whatever because they won't necessarily relate to it. But we're humans. A language is this very funky thing that we do with one another. And there's all, often always a way of reaching that other person who you know you may, you may not have much other, otherwise in common with. And for me, this is a way of creating hope even when I don't have hope. So maybe I'm repeating mm -hmm. myself a bit, but this is this is why I, this is how I when I when I manage, sometimes I don't, but when I do manage, <laughs> this is this is how I I am able to do this continue doing this even when the horizon is not necessarily like clear you know necessarily in front of me i'm trying to make it clearer but it's not necessarily yeah. clear yeah yeah i think that like um speaking to people in a language that they understand is a little bit easier to to get some of these topics in front of people because there's a lot of um negative associations with like terms and stuff like that if you talk to somebody say for instance like a conservative they might they, they might agree with you on a bunch of uh, topics, say, for instance, like localism, yeah. of moving away from globalist systems into more, uh, you know, uh, local communities and bringing back the idea of communities. Like, I think we could both agree on that. Mm -hmm. But if you say we want to do this through, uh, I don't know, some form of democratic confederalism or anarchism or whatever, they instantly shut down. That's it. End of conversation. Yeah. But if you can show, OK, well... Let's talk about localism. Let's talk about, okay, um, how do we get corporate and government control out of our lives? Well, maybe we can do that through building autonomous 
you know, communications or internet systems. Here's how to build it. Here's uh, here's a prototype or, or, or here's like step by step on how to do this type of stuff. And then it becomes instead of like this far fetched reality, exactly. it becomes the reality it becomes real because you're showing, OK, well, I might tell you you know, a a speculative idea, but here's a device that came from this idea that exists in reality. Um, You know, thinking about like the future, we're going to be facing um, water crisis after water crisis. Mm -hmm. Um, And so if you're thinking about the future, you're you're saying, okay, well, what are some ways that we can capture drinkable water? Um, And so the idea of like, you know, natural rainwater harvesting or, stuff like atmospheric water generation and stuff like that sounds really futuristic until you actually make a device and show somebody the schematics to make it and say, this is the reality that we're going to have to deal with in the future. Water scarcity, water problems. uh, But we have things that me and you can build and do right now to help alleviate that situation in the future. And it's combining that imagination of looking at the future and combining the reality of, okay, well, what are some concrete steps that I can take to get to that future? Um, that I think that circumvents a lot of people's reservations or a lot of people's ideas about reality in the future and about the past too, when you show them the real, um, and not the hyper real or the imagined past or whatever, you know, bullshit fantasy that they have about, uh, about things. So, mm-hmm. yeah, I think that's, uh, well, I think that's a wonderfully optimistic note to uh, wrap up. Uh, I, I can do this for hours, but I need to make dinner. <laughs> <laughs> um, so what I usually do, and I'm, I'm, I hope uh, I can say that I would, I would, I mean, I'd love to have you on again. I'm sure there's going to be some topic that we can get into a bit more eventually. Um, yeah. Okay. So what I usually ask all guests when we kind of finish is like, what are three books or other whatever you, that you would recommend to listeners and why those three? Um, yeah, so three books. So I'd probably start with um, Walk Away by Cory Doctorow. Um, fantastic piece of fiction. I would say it kind of falls into the idea of solar punk. Mm-hmm. Um, it's about a, a near future um, with a group of people who walk away from normal society and kind of go off and build like these, I, I guess you could consider egalitarian communes out in the the outer regions of these mega cities. And so I think it really does point out some interesting ideas about thinking of the future and thinking about um, alternatives, alternative societies and what that might look like when an alternative society has to deal with uh, the, the people who are quote unquote realists who are in reality uh, kind of just maniacs. Mm -hmm. Um, (laughs) Mm -hmm. So I really love that book. I, I, one of the best pieces of fiction that I, that I personally recommend to like everybody. Um, another book would be the Dawn of everything by, uh, David Graeber and David Wingrow probably recommended a lot on your mm-hmm. podcast, yeah. but, um, <laughs> it's an amazing book that points out, you know, um, our, our ideas of, of the past are really flawed. And if we're going to look at the realities of say, um, indigenous life and the impacts that indigenous people have had on society, we should really look at the realities of the things instead of these made up imaginaries about the past or made up imaginaries, um that some people say is reality because if we're going to look at reality let's actually look at the actual history and the impacts that people have had um on the, in the future um another one is low tech um low tech design by radical indigenism by julia watson mm. um and that's l o dash t e k design um, by Julia Watson. Um, it's an amazing book. It's really well designed. I love the design of it. It has um, really great pictures and diagrams, but basically it goes into um, some of the really sophisticated technology that indigenous people around the world have built um, both in ancient times and coming up to now. And coming up to now, um, how indigenous people have used what we would consider, I think, especially in the West as low technology, Mm -hmm. but they are extremely sophisticated ways of capturing rainwater, of uh, maintaining uh, ecological resources, of reusing ecological resources that I think a lot of people would consider to be uh, futuristic, but really we've been, humans have been doing this for thousands of years. 
but the histories and the methods have been erased by colonialism and, and, and racism and capitalism. Um, and there, there are people who have solutions uh, or really who have methods and frameworks of going into the future that we can learn from who have been doing this for a really long time. Um, and so I think that book really like showcases and shows all the details into like how these systems work and how that impacts their societies too. Um, so uh, yeah, I think that's a really good, great, great book too. Amazing. I actually recently started Corey's book. Uh, it's amazing so far. I'm sure it's going to continue being amazing. <laughs> um, well, Andre, thanks a lot for coming on. This was really honestly fantastic and, and, and much fun. And as I said, I'm sure, sh- I'm sure I'll have you on again at some point. <laughs> Yeah, that'd be awesome. I know that we have a lot to talk about because we're pretty much on the same page. Yes, I think so too. (laughs) (laughs) Defy These Times is hosted by myself, Joey Ayou. I am also its producer, researcher, writer, and sound editor. If you want to help turn this project into a full-time job, please head out to patreon.com slash fire these times to support it. These episodes are part of a bigger project which includes resources, a newsletter, and eventually YouTube video essays as well. As always, thank you for listening and take care.